Uh, we are going to be kind of finishing up uh, the practical implications of the family and the workplace. Uh, next week we deal with the workplace. And then we are actually beginning another series that's still continuing in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, but it will be on the armor of the believer. So we are going to be focusing on the armor, looking at each piece, and so in a couple of weeks we'll be launching that uh, particular series. Well, this morning, uh, I, I won't say I'm pumped up, but, but I am pumped up, uh, two weeks of not preaching Uh, I got fire in my bones, so we're probably going to be here till about noon, so no, just kidding. We'll we'll try to hold off. One of the things that we uh, understand about our very existence this morning is that everything revolves around who? What does everything revolve around? God, right? The very fact that you breathe, that we exist, that we work, that we raise a family, Everything is based on the whole fact that you have been created for God. That is a very important concept, and it was a very important concept to the Jewish people. The Jewish people had a saying that they would memorize and they would understand it in a personal way. The heart of God's truth is really about God himself. It is the central truth of the Old Testament revelation. In fact, we hear about it and read about it in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6. And so if you will look on the screen with me as we begin to take apart this understanding, notice what verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so we understand about the fact that the resulting truth is about then man's response to God. And so we read, you shall love the Lord your God. Now this is an impossible task, but yet it is what's required of us. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be in your what? Heart. Again, we can try to do this as much as we can, but the reality is, is that if we really try to take on that endeavor, we find ourselves coming up short. So thankfully, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, it is possible then for us to actually complete that task. Now, that message Israel was to take for herself and then pass it on to the world. In fact, I want you to take your notes out with me this morning and look at the first thing about what we just looked at in Deuteronomy. The first step in taking God's truth was to pass it on, listen carefully, to their children to pass it on to their children. And we do that, look at it carefully, by teaching diligently. Now, when we talk today about children, we are a church, quite frankly, of grandparents. Okay, We have grandchildren. So all of the things that we are going to be talking about this morning, about teaching diligently, adding to the point of trying to raise godly children for those that are young parents, this is also a plea to us as grandparents and even as great-grandparents. So we have an incredible task set in front of us because the responsibility of family does not end after your children are grown and out of the house. In fact, we're living in a culture where it seems like the kids come back, uh, probably more often than they leave. We have a revolving door in our house. It seems like we always got one kid coming or going, and at least when Shelly and I were first empty nesters, it seemed like, oh, this is great, man. It's going to be Shelly and me, hand in hand, sitting on the, on the rocking chair watching the sunset. Oh, how great. Not. No. The children still need us. And then, as that goes on, the grandchildren. This, folks, 
is a world in which we're living where many grandparents are raising their grandkids, okay? So what we have to talk about this morning is very, very important when we talk about teaching diligently. Because teaching diligently means that you and I, especially if our kids do not walk in the faith, or our kids are gone for long periods of time, and we as grandparents have the kids, we are to teach them diligently. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7, it says, you shall teach them diligently to your children, and again, we're saying grandchildren, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. What is that saying? How much time? All the time, right? What it's trying to say is, is that we are to be diligent in teaching our kids, parents were to continually speak about the things of God so that the knowledge and the love of Him would become a matter of life and breath for the family. And when the parents were not speaking, the testimony would still continue. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8. It says, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So when the parent isn't there speaking, they can see it. They are able to see how God is to be supreme in their life. Never has it been more important than the future generation of the church to be able to be instilled with the values of who God is. That it's about God and not them. We have different coin phrases for different generations of people. We now have uh, our kids' generation, which is called the millennial generation. And if you've heard much about that generation, it's a me generation. It's about themselves. And really, we are to be teaching them that it's about God. Even when the parents are gone, the testimony remained because it was written, as you see there in the text, on the doorposts, on the gates. In other words, there was always to be both a verbal and a visible commitment to the Word of God in the home. It is God's plan for His Word to be passed on from one generation to the next. And His primary agent to do that is the family. Now, one of the things that has recently happened to me, I don't understand what happened to me, but recently, the burden that has been put on my heart is to be pouring my life into my grandkids. You see, I came not long ago from the mentality that I didn't ask my kids to marry who they married. I didn't make the choices that they made. And terrible as it might sound, I actually said, you know what? Let them deal with their family. We've already raised ours. And recently the Lord has spoken to me and saying, I have put you in a position in which you are to smother with love and grace the word of God to your grandkids. So you know what? Every opportunity I get is going to be to try to implement truth and grace and gospel into my grandkids. And by the way, it's really interesting because grandkids seem to really listen to grandparents. You ever notice that? Your kids never listen to you. But it seems like that the grandkids actually respect you and listen to you, which is really cool. I said to Shelly, this never happens before. And this is great. They take in what you say to them. And so, we have an incredible opportunity. And that is what this morning's lesson is going to be all about. Now, let me kind of give a little bit of background. This is kind of a longer introduction because I need to make this point. From the time of the fall, the family has been plagued with problems, obviously. Every sort that weaken and undermine and threaten to destroy the family. It's obvious. Satan targets the future kids. And his goal is to sabotage family. However he can cause a rift 
whether it's a problem between the relationship of husband and wife, he will try to attack the kids. If I don't need to say it again and remind you that the enemy is very unfair and very manipulative. But there are two problems that I see at least that weaken or at least are the basics for weakening the family. The first cause of those problems, as of every human problem, if you look at your notes, is the sinful nature with which every person is born. We are not born with a clean slate. Please understand that there is no such thing as a clean slate. The curse of the fall has been built into the family. It is the curse that causes men to be chauvinistic, women to usurp the place of men, children to be disobedient to their parents, and and parents to be abusive to their children. It is the result of the sinful nature that we all have. Only where Christ is in control as Savior and Lord can a family ever live up to the standards and fulfill the ministry that really God commands. The second cause of the problems is this. Look at your notes. The satanic world system in which we live. I don't have to say much about this. You only have to turn on the television, which we are rarely starting to do now because even the commercials are, are, are something that you have to have your kids out of the room for. I mean, never has it been this bad. I grew up in the 70s, and they had pretty strict uh, rules about what is put on. You couldn't have any type of obscenities in, in language of, on the television. Censors, they called them, right? Now, they can use the Lord's name in vain on television without any thought about it. The commercials that show same-sex relationships are just all out there. So kids are being assaulted not only of being accepted in that lifestyle, but also the system is changing. I don't want to go too far off the bent here, but I I had a meeting a couple days ago with our Awana um, missionary, and uh, we had a chance, Shelly and I did, to sit down with him, and uh, he was sharing with us that he had a problem. He had to go to the principal because his sixth grade daughter, Dallas, was in the public school system, and the teacher was a professing lesbian talking about her uh, female partner and she actually said to the kids in the class it is wrong for a man to be married to a woman because the man will manipulate and brainwash the woman so the kid comes home dallas comes home and goes to his dad and says daddy is it (laughs) It's, my teacher says that it's wrong for me to want a relationship with a man because it could be dangerous for me. So naturally, he had an appointment to see the principal on the day that he met with me, and Shelly and I had a chance to hear what the principal had to say about it. And um, hopefully they're going to be taking care of the situation. But look at folks, this is what's out there. This is the stuff that our, that our grandkids and kids are, are being assaulted with, a satanic world system that says it's okay to sin. Because God's plan is to build and strengthen and protect the family, Satan's plan is to undermine, weaken, destroy it by every means possible. He designs to push the family into the mold of the world's system of values, which is now to accept any kind of behavior. And to not do that is to be considered to be unloving and narrow-minded. You can see how Satan does that, can't you? God is a God of love, and he wants love everywhere, whether it's a man with a man or a woman with a woman. You can just see he manipulates it, and he... He takes what God has designed to be beautiful in the family and he perverts it. Because of those two major sources, much has been written to deal with the fallout. I brought with me this morning just a a small sampling out of my study. There's many more books I could have added to this, but this is just a few of the books that deal with the problems that parents are dealing with. One of the ones from our biblical counseling, the, The Heart of Anger. We got kids now that are losing their temper 
and screaming at their parents. Josh McDowell, how to help your child say no. Helping young, struggling teenagers. By the way, teenage suicide is on the increase like crazy. Parenting teens with love and logic. Parenting teens with love and logic in a depraved world by Foster Klein and Jim Fay. This is a, a wonderful book, by the way. Every Young Woman's Battle. You ought to read the stories that are in here of what young people have to deal with. It goes on. Success for teens. Teens talk about dealing and living on the edge. It goes on. Turbulent teens and panicking parents. Teenage girls, oh my goodness, the kind of counseling that I have been doing in this area of uh, pre-adolescent kids who are being told that their gender identities can be either or and they get to make the choice. How do parents deal with that? Almost 13, shaping your child's teenage years today. The list goes on and on and on. All of the stuff is bombarding these kids with no ability to come to a rational explanation of how to deal with a culture that is twisting our kids' minds. Thank goodness we got the Bible. Thank goodness God's truth doesn't change. It doesn't waver. It tells it in black and white. It doesn't say that because the culture changes, the way that we raise kids changes. By the way, some of the things that we're going to be talking about today, if I was to preach this publicly, I would be considered to be a child abuser by the stuff that we're going to be learning from God's Word today. I would be considered an unloving parent, not giving my child the freedom to expand their own creativity and how they were made. But in God's word, parents have every truth, every guideline necessary for raising their children in righteousness and godliness. And what a child needs is to know how he or she can relate in this kind of world. So, in Ephesians chapter 6, as we begin verses 1 through 4, Paul is continuing his teaching on the mutual submission of believers. Remember? The wife is to respect and submit to her husband. The husband is to love his wife. It is continuing in this section of how the family is to be organized. In fact, in verse 21 of chapter 5, you see it carefully, submitting to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. That's why we submit to each other. That's why Shelley will say to me, you're wrong, but I'll still submit to you, but just understand you're wrong. And usually it doesn't take very long, and I'll figure out, yeah, I guess I was wrong. So mutual submission says, because of Christ, I will give to you first. Now, one of the things that we're going to be looking at is 1 through 3, verses 1 through 3, focuses on the submission of children. And verse 4, then, will focus on the submission of parents. Okay? So we're going to be able to see instructions for both. So let's look, first of all, at Paul's instruction for children. He is drawing a close um, comparison with the instructions about reminding them of Moses. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Children, and I would underline or circle the next word, obey. Obey your parents. Now notice the next three words, in the Lord. That's very important. For this is right. And the Holy Spirit makes sure that we get this right. Obeying also means to submit, but that submission has limits. You are to obey your parents in the Lord. Which means that if a parent asks a child to do something that the Bible says is wrong, the child has a right to say, no, I won't submit. So 
The Holy Spirit makes it very clear in the Lord is talking about godly principles that are being put forth. So the first directive comes for the children, obey your parents in the Lord. Let's look at the word obey. It is the word hupakao. It means to hear under. It's a a subordinate. It means to listen attentively. It means to heed or conform to a command or authority. Now, let me just say, kids, this doesn't come naturally. Now, you've been trained to respect, right? But sometimes your parents will ask you to do something that you don't want to do. The natural sinful desire is to rebel. But here, Paul is making a command that they are to obey. And again here, look at your notes. In the Lord, this refers to the sphere of pleasing the Lord. Again, notice, to obey parents for the Lord's sake, children obey their parents as reflective of their obedience to the Lord. In other words, kids, when your parents ask you to do something that you don't want to do, and you do it, guess what? You are actually doing that for the Lord. You're doing it for your parents at a certain level, but you are really submitting to Jesus. Just like when the wife is to submit to her husband, though she may not agree with what he's doing, the fact that she's submitting is saying, I am submitting to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And vice versa with the husband. And so it's no different for the children. The children are submitting not just to their parents, but more importantly, they're submitting to God. That means he gets glory out of that. The context makes it clear that the Lord applies here to honor as well as to obey. Look at your notes. Parents are to be obeyed and honored because to do so is to obey and honor the Lord. There is a transference there. John MacArthur says, Parents stand in the gap, so to speak, between children and God while the children are too young to have a full and mature relationship with Him themselves. Parents are God's stewards, His proxy authority for their children who are simply loaned to them in trust by their own Heavenly Father. That is why children are commanded, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord, Colossians 3.20 says. And the only exception to that obedience is in the matter of doing what's wrong. Kids, God has placed your parents in authority over you because you need wisdom, you need their guidance, you need their protection that they are providing for you. It doesn't mean that you're going to like everything they do. I'm not going to take a survey this morning of the kids of how much they like to do what their parents tell them to do. But yet, that's what they're commanded to do. In fact, if you think about it, kids, think of this. Jesus himself, who is the very Son of God, continued in his obedience with his earthly parents. You remember that time when, when Jesus was 12 and he, and he wandered into the temple and he was teaching? And his parents took a two-day journey. Now think of that. Two-day journey before they discovered that their kid, he must have been a quiet kid, uh, was gone or missing. Right? How many 12-year-olds you don't know it's missing for two days? All of a sudden, they turned around, they went back. This is two days. And all of a sudden, Mary goes in and sees Jesus, that little 12-year-old boy who, in the Jewish mindset, is considered to be an adult at that point. Notice what she says to him. It's incredible. Notice the text. He, Jesus, went down with them. And he came to Nazareth, well, look at it, and he continued in subjection to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. He didn't disobey her by going down to the temple. He, that was where he belonged, by the way. Mary didn't get it. She didn't understand it. And it says he continued in obedience, which means he's always been obedient to his parents. And this is just one more thing in which he left the temple that he belonged to be at, and he went home to be with his mom. It would have been better, folks, let me just say it this way, it would have been better for him to stay in the temple and teach. But he cut it short to be in subjection with his parents, 
and he traveled back with them. He continued in his obedience to his parents. Even when his parents didn't understand why he needed to stay in the temple, he continued as he always had to submit himself under their authority. Listen, kids. Your home is a school for life with your parents who are ideally, look at your notes, who are ideally teaching and equipping you. Your parents are teaching and equipping you and to live out Christ's gospel and to walk in love and righteousness. So let me just start preaching here really quickly. What does that say the awesome responsibility is for kids that are parents? People who are raising their kids, where ought they ought to be on a Sunday morning? Absolutely. And guess what? I thought about this. If they're not in church on a Sunday morning, they're not worshiping the Lord as they ought to be, not only are the parents going to be held responsible for it, but what does it teach the kids? You are literally training the child to say it's okay to not go to church. You're teaching them that. You're literally saying whatever it is that you're doing when you're not in church is more important than being in church. Tough words, folks, but this is the Bible. We are to be teaching and equipping and living it out with our kids to walk in love and righteousness. And children are to honor both their father and their mother to hold them in the highest respect possible. And when God first introduced His written law, you remember the Ten Commandments, the very first law relating to human relationships. Notice it carefully behind me in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Again, MacArthur goes on to say, it is the only commandment of the ten that relates to the family because that one principle alone, when obeyed, is enough to secure the right relationship of children to their parents. Respect for parents is of such grave importance to God that Moses commanded, he who strikes his father and his mother shall surely be put to death. He who curses his father and mother shall surely be put to death. And that was a pretty strict penalty for disobeying parents. Either to physically or verbally abuse a parent was a capital offense in ancient Israel. Listen carefully. Children have to be trained to obey and honor their parents by their parents. The book of Proverbs, as we'll see later, is full of all kinds of truths to give parents. Again, truths that the world will look at as not important or not proper. So, that's the instruction for children. I want to move to the more important part, really, which is Paul's instruction for parents then. Because if it's the responsibility for teaching, equipping, to live out, and to walk in love and righteousness, somebody has got to be taking the charge to do that. And again, folks, listen to me very carefully. If your kids are not doing that with your grandkids, guess what? You have to do it. I'm going to say it like it is. If their parents are not born again, if they don't see the value of bringing their children up in the admonition and the teaching of the Lord, if they're not going to do it, then guess what? God holds you responsible to do it. And that's the conviction that fell on my heart. Shelly and I are blessed to be able to have grandchildren whose parents do not walk with the Lord. Thankfully, the parents are open to letting us take them to church in every single chance we get. They're going to be here. In fact, next week, uh, 
we have a chance of taking our grandkids for a week and we'll be bringing them to church. And it's really cool because grandkids love church when they can go with grandma and grandpa. And we've got testimonies, folks, in this church of people who have raised their grandkids in the church. And it's changed those kids' lives. So the admonition becomes very important to us. So we've seen the necessity of parents to train up their child with discipline. Paul next turns in verse 4. Look at it. Fathers. Notice he doesn't say mothers here. Again, the idea was supposed to be that the um, training of spiritual principles was supposed to come from the father. And of course, our culture's got that totally upside down now. Usually it's the mother. But here the command is to the fathers. Fathers, grandfathers. Notice what he says. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the, circle the next word, discipline. And next key word, instruction of the Lord. Now, I want to unpack that verse because there's a lot of misconceptions about what that means and what it looks like. The first thing I want to do is give you the negative command, okay? The, the, the discipline part. There are some very interesting things that are going on in that simple verse. It begins with that negative statement, do not provoke your children to anger. Let's look at it. Notice behind me the word provoke. The word provoke literally is the word paragizo. And it means uh, two words. Para means to come alongside of. The paraclete is the Holy Spirit coming alongside. So para means alongside. Gizo means to enrage. So it literally means to enrage alongside anger and bitterness. It literally means to become exasperated. To be bitter. To be frustrated. It can happen when a father snaps out a command without really explaining what it is that is going on and the need for any corrective things that are going to be happening. It's just to blurt out with a negative discouragement. And we'll look at a couple of those in a moment. So look at your notes. To provoke to anger suggests a repeated ongoing pattern of treatment that gradually, notice the next bullet, builds up a deep-seated anger and resentment that boils over in outward hostility. I have counseled so many kids that are dealing with a lot of the outward hostility, and it comes from the very fact that they have been embittered by their parents. I'm dealing now with more angry kids than I have ever in my ministry. And here's some of the things that happens to, to add to that. Why these kids are feeling it. In my, in my time of counseling, helping young kids, boys and girls, here's the things that I have found that have caused this kind of embitterment. Unrealistic expectations. Achievement goals. You need to be here and you're not here. Comparing children. You're not like your brother. Why can't you be like him? Overprotection, smothering. Oh, baby, I don't want you to just stay next to... By the way, for those of you who are into music, that's what the Pink Floyd uh, album that was called The Wall was all about. That album was made out of a, a psychological research of a smothering parent. Causes all kinds of problems. Favoritism. You know, it doesn't take long for a child to know that you might have a favorite or someone that, is, that you have a tendency to be drawn to more, and that causes all kinds of problems. You remember what happened in the Bible with Jacob and Joseph, remember that? He made him a special coat, and his brothers hated him. It wasn't good. Favoritism is never good. Discouragement. Always 
telling their kids what they're doing is wrong. Always saying, you know, why can't you do this? And then the child does something, they, 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 they do a wonderful job at something, and then the parent says, yeah, but you didn't do this. So discouragement. And then, of course, excessive physical discipline, whether it's verbal abuse or physical abuse. Those are the things that I've seen in my counseling dealing with young kids. And some kids are resilient and they can get past it, and some, it will cripple them. So that's the idea of provoking. Let's look at the positive command. The positive command in the text there says, bring them up. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The word discipline here now is not the kind of word that you're thinking when you're thinking of always a corrective physical uh, type of discipline. This is really a positive term here. Notice on the overhead the word discipline, it's the word paideia. It's a systematic instruction of a child. That's all it is. It's instructing, teaching a child. It can include correction, but really it's based on the idea of encouragement. So this word discipline here, this particular word, paideia, means to really take that child aside and invest in them and give of them, encourage them, and spark them with whatever natural bent or giftedness that they might have. And with that, I want to move to the perspective of Proverbs. Paul's meaning here is expressed more fully in one of the most misinterpreted passages, you've heard me preach on this, and we're going to touch on it lately. Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22. Go to the Psalms and then go to Proverbs after that and find chapter 22. Again, with this being the most misinterpreted passage, I'm hoping if you have never heard me preach on it before, you'll get the clarification of what this verse is saying and what it's not saying. So here it is, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now normally, the, the reading that is given there normally speaks about an idea, well, if you just bring your kids to church, you just instill good values, when they get old, they'll eventually come back to it. How many people have heard that as the popular interpretation? You just do right things. Do good things to your kids. When they're old, it'll, they'll catch on. That's not what the verse is talking about at all. In fact, it's really a negative verse. It's a warning verse, really. This is a verse that in the context of what parents are to do with their children, Solomon is speaking of the necessity of discipline here. Here he's speaking of corrective discipline. Look at the text again. The word train up is the Hebrew word kanak. And it literally means to instruct, to have a certain pattern of behavior that continues until it's repeated. So in other words, you memorize something by continually doing it, right? That's the word to train up. It means to repeat a behavior. And in this case, a bad behavior, okay? In other words, I can train someone by allowing a certain behavior to continue so that it forms a habit. Stay with me. So if I allow a child to continue in a bad behavior, the problem is going to be is the child is going to continue in that bad behavior. And that's the first step in understanding the passage. Notice the next part, in the way he should go. That's, the, that's where the misinterpretation comes because people say, well, if I train them in the way that I think that they should go, they're, they're going to continue to do that. That's not what it's saying. The word here, the way, is the word derak, and it means his bent or her bent. A bent is an individual pattern of behavior. Let me give you an example. The negative bent of a child would be stubbornness, rebelliousness, flirtatious, ornery, lazy, defiant, okay? Those are the basic bents that some kids have. Some kids are just obstinate. Some kids are very tender-hearted. 
But each child has a way about them. They have a bent. And what Solomon is saying is, you need to first discover what the bent of your child is. Is your child lazy by nature? Then you need to somehow correct that laziness. So this is a warning verse. So, listen to this carefully. Each child has a way about them that can be amplified by how we parent them. If we allow a behavior or pattern to continue, Solomon is speaking primarily about negative behavior traits. So let me go back to the example that I gave about us as grandparents and the importance of bringing our children and bringing them up uh, to go to church and so on. Here's how that bent would work. If I allowed my child, because me as a parent don't go to church, don't feel like getting up, don't really want to go through the process of it, my child is in the house and my child says, well, you know, dad doesn't want to go to church today or mom doesn't want to go to church today or we've got something else that's more important. You know, maybe we got an activity that we're doing or whatever it might be. And so, therefore, it's okay for him to do it. I, he doesn't make me go, so guess what happens? The bent is then passed on to the child, and the child grows up, and guess what? They don't go to church. Why? Because they saw it modeled by their parents. That's just an example of how this bent is that we're talking about. So, let me take a look at it. When we put the two thoughts, train up and the way together, this is what we see. So look at the verse. I want you to look at it carefully because this is what the verse actually says, okay? Allow a child to go along in their particular bad behavior while they are young. When they get older, that behavior will continue on into adulthood. That's what it means. So that changes the whole understanding of how that verse has been misinterpreted over the years. So guess what? You got a child who's lazy, and you got a child that's spoiled. You got a lazy, spoiled kid. Guess what's going to happen when they get a job? Now they're going to be the employer's problem. <laughs> now the employer has to deal with a lazy, spoiled kid because it never got trained out of them. It never got corrected. And so Solomon makes an incredible wisdom here. He's saying, you better do something to curve that bent now as parents, because when they get older, if you haven't curved it out of them, it's going to continue on into adulthood. And again, Solomon is warning parents of the continual need to stop the bad behavior in their children when they're young. So hopefully, when they grow into adults, they will have been trained to act decently. Now, here's where it gets unpopular. Several passages in Proverbs go along with this verse, and they correlate this verse that will be helpful to us to understand it better. Now, when I read this, please do not take the word rod, which you will hear, as a physical act necessarily of beating, hurting. This is not talking about physical abuse here. The rod simply means some method in which the discipline of the child is going to be trained. It doesn't have to be physical. The rod, as we're going to look at it, can be used as an instrument in which it could be a, a grounding of that child or taking away a privilege, whatever. It is not always with the understanding of a physical act, although it can mean that. Let's look at it. This correlates the verse I just read. Let's look at the first one, Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Look at that. It actually says, if I don't discipline my kid, I don't love him. I actually hate him. Look at the next one. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. All of this is correlation to that train up a child. Look at the next one. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. If I was to read that in public, you know what they would do? Pastor Brett is into physical discipline and abuse of children. This, this is the scripture. Look at the next one. 
The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself. That, that's the corollary to our verse here. Left to himself brings shame to his mother. When the wicked increase, transgression increases, but the righteous will look upon their downfall. It's incredible. Discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. This, this is incredible, folks. All throughout the text. So please understand, though you have probably heard this verse mistranslated, train up a child the way you should go, hopefully you have an understanding now of what it is really saying and what the context says it says. Listen to, uh, again, a commentator had made this announcement about Susanna Wesley. Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley, raised 17 children and had these words to say about raising children. I guess she could be an authority if she raised 17 children. The parent who studies to subdue the self-will in his child works together with God in the renewing and saving a soul. The parent who indulges the child's self-will does the devil's work makes religion impractical, salvation unattainable, and does all that in him lies to damn his child, soul, and body forever, unquote. Wow. Incredible. Pretty serious words about the need of parents to break the self-will of their child, not to break their spirit, but to break the self-will. And look at the word here, instruction. Again, you'll see it is the word nuthasia. It means putting into the mind, calling attention to, correction, right attitudes, principles, and behavior. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And the key to right discipline and instruction of the Lord is its being of the Lord. Everything parents do for their children is to be of God. According to the teaching of His Word, by the guidance and the power of His Holy Spirit, in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, into His own glory and honor. By the way, we can see what happens when we don't take the time. I, I have to give this to you. I know we're running out of time, but we got to go here, folks, because it's so important to see this biblical example of what can happen if you don't discipline your children, okay? Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel in chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and um, this is a domestic failure of a high priest by the name of Eli. 1 Samuel chapter 2, let's, let's begin with verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. Boy, can you imagine the Bible speaking that? They were worthless men, they did not know the Lord. So you're dealing there with an unsaved individual. Drop down to verse 17. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. Look at this. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. What was it that they did? What was it that was so bad? It's pretty amazing. Look at down at verse 22. Now Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel. Now look at what they did and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. I mean, that's despicable. This is the Lord's house. This is where the, this is where the sacrifice was happening. And, and he found the women and he, they, would, they would, you know, with the women. I can't even say it. It was awful. And so as a result of this, go over to chapter 3, verse 11. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end, and I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and look at it, and he did not restrain them. He let them go in the way that they would go. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. This is incredible, folks. 
They were held responsible for not disciplining their children. Not only did the kids get killed and God took them out, but he also would remove the blessing from Eli forever. Do you see the importance of the responsibility that you and I have to raise godly kids and godly grandkids? Look at your notes. Clear, forthright instruction is necessary for proper upbringing. And folks, this is the part that hurts us, but it takes time and it takes thought. These two elements so often are neglected in today's busy domestic world. The problem that we have today, and you'll see it on the overhead here, here's the number one problem that we see with kids today. Take a look at it. There it is. This has become the babysitter. This has become the thing that we go to because we don't have time. Because there's all kinds of things that we have to be doing and we have to get it done. I mean, we're driven people and we have time frames and we have things that have to happen, but the kids are left to themselves, and who knows what they're, what they're doing on that thing. It can be as innocent as playing a game. When we were kids, we were on our bikes. We were doing whatever, you know, but we weren't sitting at home behind a screen, and that's, that's our world. That's, that's what we have. Video, YouTube, electronic games have replaced this in raising of kids and grandkids. So let me close with two concluding principles. I want to wrap it up. I realize that most of us here again this morning have little or no control on how our grandkids are raised, okay? God only holds you responsible for whatever you have and whatever time you have with them. You can't, you can't dictate what their parents are doing, but you can instill what you have with them and it still applies. So it's in, the, it's in the form of a question. What do our children gain from a nurturing home? And that's what we want to provide, right? Number one, nurturing parents help their children to know who they are. To know who they are. Our kids need us to show them their strengths. They need us to tell them what we see in them, encouragement. And I know it's politically uncorrect, but a little girl needs to be told that she's pretty. She needs to be told that she's attractive and precious to you. You need to be the granddaughter's boyfriend if necessary to show how much value she has. And our world has perverted that and made it sick. And I know there's a place for the, for the, for the abuse of that, but I'm talking about people who need to be telling their kids that they're handsome and that they're pretty and that you love them. Positive words from involved parents and grandparents deposit precious coins of confidence. Number two, nurturing parents take time to cultivate their children's individuality. An attentive gardener knows that each plant needs different care. Some need more water, some need cutting and pruning, some need to be drained of soil. And nurturing parents will take the time to know their children's makeup. So let's take the command of the Word of God and let's commit as parents and grandparents to do the work of bringing our kids up with godly instruction. Let's pray.